Hello everyone and welcome to today's session on the impact of coronavirus um, on immigration and employment. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Padma and I'm a senior associate in our employment team and business immigration team. Um, and I'm joined by Mandeep, who uh, heads up our immigration service in our London office. Um, and today, Mandeep and I are going to go through some of the, the frequently asked questions that we've been getting through during this pandemic in relation to uh, immigration, ranging from um, what to do with your sponsor licences, uh, right to work checks and all those typical things um, that we've been getting. Um, Today's session is recorded um, and we will send out a link after the event. So uh, if you want to watch it again or if um, your colleagues uh, would like to see it, then by all means, you can pass that on. Um, we are obviously um, sat remotely um, and so we don't get to see your smiling faces in our offices as we usually do, but we are quite keen um, to have it as interactive as possible. So. On your chat function, there should be an ability for you to ask questions. So please keep those questions coming in um, and we will try and answer those as we go along. Um, if you can try and um, at least just put your name when you're asking the question. Only we can see that you've asked the question, so not everyone else can see that. Um, but what that will allow us to do is if for whatever reason we're unable to answer it during today's session, um, because we found on other sessions that we have ran and um, that we get inundated with questions and we don't have enough time to go through everything, then we'll make sure that we contact you uh, after the event to go through uh, any additional questions that you have. So as I say, please keep those questions coming in and we will try and cover those off as we go along. Um, and also, finally, this is part of um, a whole series of coronavirus webinars that we are doing as a firm. Um, and at the end, I will um, signpost you to our webinar hub for coronavirus, which has loads of facts, tips, questions, other webinars that might be of interest to you. Um, so do keep a lookout for those as well um, and uh, see whether there's other things of interest on there for you. So. Without further ado, I am going to kickstart today's session and um, what Mandeep and I thought would be good and um, would be for us to um, run through these as case studies and um, so it allows you to then put things into context. So first case study, um, before lockdown began, um, ABC Limited identified uh, a non-EEA national to fill a job vacancy. The job was advertised in the correct way with all the relevant home office recruitment guidelines and ultimately the position was offered. And the only remaining step then was for the company to apply for what is known as a sponsorship license and assign that certificate of sponsorship to the migrant. So Mandy, um, can the company apply for a sponsorship license during the pandemic? Um, yeah, so thanks uh, Padma. The answer to that question is yes, uh, the company can apply for a sponsorship license during the pandemic. The only thing that I would say that is really important really is that during the pandemic, if the caseworker um, isn't quite sure whether the company should be granted a sponsorship license because they're not quite sure whether the company has the right compliance um, uh, issues in, in, in place, then what they may, what they would normally do is go out for what's called a pre-license audit. So they would come and visit the company, look at what's on, um, how they uh, are on their system, how they're coping with the systems, how they would manage having you know migrant workers working for them and keeping control of them and knowing where they are. But because of COVID-19, the caseworkers are not coming out for these pre-license audits. So those applications are currently on hold where the Home Office feel that they do need to carry out um, this pre-license audit. Um, and because of that, there would be a, a major delay in the applications being determined. Normally, with the sponsor license applications on the Home Office website, it states that applications normally take 18 weeks for the cases to be for the sponsor license cases to be determined. However, we've been really lucky, even during COVID-19, that we've been preparing the applications in such a way 
that the applications have been successful within less than five working days. Also, what's important to note with the current sponsor license application process is if you are submitting a sponsor license application prior to COVID-19, the company would need to include certified documents or they need to submit the original documents within five working days of their sponsor license application being submitted online. The situation now because of COVID-19 and the Home Office accept and understand that people can't get the original documents um, or certified copies of documents, that they're accepting uh, copies of documents up until the end of this month. They may increase that time frame, um, but at the moment it's only up until the end of this month. Um, so yeah, so that's the situation with regards to, um, you know, you can still apply for the uh, sponsorship license. Okay, thank you for that, Mandy. Um, I think, um, I, I presume it's towards the end of this month because they'll be looking at um, lockdown restrictions being eased. So yeah. hopefully it should be easier for people to, to start getting those certified documents. And I guess as an employment lawyer, one thing that I uh, probably add on to that is um, when offers and things like that are being made, it's quite clear then that um, they really need to make sure as an employer that all offer documents, contracts of employment are very clear that any offers are conditional upon receiving the license, conditional upon the visa then coming through. Um, and as you say, making sure that if for whatever reason, none of those things or one of those things doesn't stack up, that it allows you to terminate that employment um, or rescind the offer without any notice and um, just to, to limit the exposure there. Yeah. Um, so just a, a question that's um, come in. Um, you've, we've said that the uh, job advertised in the correct way. So, Mandy, do you just want to pick up on what, what we mean by that? Yeah, so normally when a migrant wants to, to work for a particular company or be sponsored by a particular company, the company needs to carry out what's called a resident labour market test to show the Home Office that there is nobody in the UK or in Europe that can carry out this particular position. Um, the Home Office are extremely pernickety and extremely fussy when it comes to the resident labour market test. It needs to be done in a particular way. And if it's not done in a particular way, they will refuse either the sponsorship license application or refuse the, the, the tier two general visa if the person's applying for it. So it's really important to carry out the relevant resident labour market test um, correctly. And what you need to do is if the migrant's job is uh, the salary is going to be 73,900 or below um, then the job would need to be advertised on what's called the find a job on the government website as well as one other job board and the advert needs to be placed for at least a 28 day period and with that you would need to include in the advert the job title the main duties and responsibilities um, which basically outline basically the job description for the, for, the, for the position. You also need to include the location of the job and um, an indication of the salary package. You don't need to know, give the exact figure, but the actual overall package, what it looks, you know, what it looks like it's going to be um, for, for, the, for, that, for that year. Also, you need to include what the skills, qualifications and experience the, the applicant really needs um, and also you need to have what's called a closing date um, on the advert and if you don't have that information so where a lot of companies make a mistake is that they don't have all that information on their adverts when they place their adverts and so what happens is when, it, when they come to us we then have to say unfortunately we're going to have to re-advertise the position to meet all these requirements and that can kind of cause a delay of at least a month um, also, what you need to know is when you're carrying out the advertising requirement that you must take screenshots of the advert on the first day that the advert has been placed and it must include the name of the website, the contents of the ad, the full contents of the advert, the URL uh, address, the date the vacancy was first advertised and also it needs to include the closing date. Um, one of the things that I actually do want to mention is 
with the advertising process, there are certain positions that don't need to be advertised. So if the job is on the Home Office's shortage occupations list, um, they don't need to be advertised. So you don't have to, 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 to carry out the resident labour market test. If the job salary is going to be over £159,600, you don't need to advertise um, the position. And also, if the migrant is applying for Tier 2 General Extension with the same company, you don't need to carry out a resident labour market test. So there are some exceptions um, to the resident labour market test, but on the whole, the majority of the people have to carry out the RLMT resident labour market test. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I think some of those examples are things like shortages of nurses and, and various other things, isn't it, Mandy? But yeah. I, I would agree with you that a lot of the time where you, you see issues coming about is where it's just that slight minor mistake in terms of having the, the start date but not the closing date, for example, um, that, that where people sort of slip up uh, on that. Yeah. Um, so just moving on to the next slide then and, and taking it a bit further. Um, so let's assume that we've got the sponsorship license, uh, supporting documents are sent electronically and the application is approved. Um, so the company has, as we've said previously, offered the uh, non-EEA national a position to come to the UK uh, on a one month visitor visa before lockdown so they can find accommodation. As a result of COVID-19, that individual is now stranded in the UK um, and they've been unable to return to their home country to make the application. Um, so, Mandy, can the migrant switch to apply for a Tier 2 visa whilst in the UK so that he can start work as soon as possible or does he have to wait to be able to go back to country of origin to then make an application? Yeah, so in that in this circumstance, um, normally, so before um, the COVID-19 pandemic, if the person was in the UK on a visitor visa, they would need to return back to their country um, in order to apply for a Tier 2 general visa to come back to the UK to, to work for, in this case, ABC Limited. However, the Home Office have realised, and obviously because of the pandemic, that people can't um, go back because there's actually no flights. Uh, and because of that, what they've said is if a migrant's visa expires between the 24th of January 2020 and the 31st of July 2020, what they can do, what the migrant can do is they can switch from the visit visa to a Tier 2 General whilst they're in the UK. Um, and this is only for people that her, their visa is actually going to expire between the 24th of January 2020 and the 31st of July 2020. So if they do that, so in this example, if the, the, the migrant applies for his Tier 2 general visa in the UK, um, he would need to submit an online form and then he would need to organise an appointment to attend one of the UK visa application centres in the UK. Now, the problem is um, since March of this year, the application centres have been closed again because of COVID-19 um, and they've only recently started opening up. So we had a case where one of our clients had submitted his application. It was for a tier two, it was actually for, sorry, for a definite leave to remain and he paid for the, the priority service, which basically means he can get a decision either within, within 24 hours but unfortunately, um, because of COVID-19, his appointment was cancelled um, and he only got an appointment over, I think just over two weeks ago and his application has been approved, but there is basically a major backlog and delay in these cases. Um, similarly, if the migrant in this example returned back to his home country, the, the visa centres overseas are also closed. So I've got a client at the moment who is applying for a tier one entrepreneur extension from Nigeria and the visa centre is still closed as of yesterday. Um, so they're going to have a major backlog um, with regards to determining applications. So either way, um, there is going to be a delay for this person to get the right visa in order to start working for or potentially start working for um, 
working for ABC Limited. Thanks, Mandy. So, so mm -hmm. effectively, I think what you're trying to say is, ideally, if they can make an out-of-country application, that's going to be the best route. So if, they, if there are flights now going out to various countries, probably try and look at that if they can. Yeah, I mean, there's advantages and disadvantages of applying while in, in the UK or uh, outside of the UK. My preference would be, or my advice to clients would be, to submit the application in the UK just because, number one, if they were going to use our services, we have got contacts within the Home Office that may be able to expedite applications, but they're only going to expedite applications if um, there is a, a, a real business need for this migrant to work for this company um, for today. day. Also, because lockdown eased earlier in the UK compared to, let's say, in my for my client in Nigeria, yeah. they're actually dealing with the cases quicker. Um, or, well, not quicker, they've just, they've just opened up sooner. So the backlog, I'm guessing, is going to be less. But ultimately, you know, if somebody's on a visit visa, I'm guessing they haven't got all of their belongings and things like that. So then it's kind of weighing up what, you know, what they want, what they want to do and how urgent it is for them to start working for um, ABC Limited. Fine. So I, I guess what you're saying is it's quite fact specific and probably yeah. uh, if you're in that situation, being in touch with your, your legal advisor, I guess, just so they can weigh up which yeah. system would work best um, in the circumstances uh, for that individual. Yeah. Um, and also, sorry, and Andy. Also, sorry. And also, hopefully, by the time that, you know, we have, let's say, if this um, individual wanted to apply for the tier two visa, we might have some processing times. For, the, for their country, you know, in the next couple of weeks or so, so we can kind of work out where, how fast um, countries are dealing with applications. Fair enough. And um, so, uh, keeping with ABC Limited, um, they've identified another migrant worker to, to fill another post, um, yeah. and that migrant worker already in the UK as a tier two migrant worker working for another company. Um, Migrant submits a fresh tier two application to the Home Office so that they can commence working for ABC Limited. However, because of the backlog, we obviously don't know when that will be. Mm -hmm. um, and as you've just mentioned, securing application appointments, all those sorts of things are, are a bit harder. So what's your recommendation in relation to that, Mandy? Can, can the migrant start working whilst we're waiting for the decision? So again, normally, the answer would be no. Um, so if before COVID-19 you're switching from one employer to another tier two general um, sponsor, you should you wouldn't be able to um, start work until you've got confirmation from the Home Office and your biometric card, which shows that you now have got a tier two general visa for ABC Limited. However, because of the current situation, what the Home Office is saying are, is that once a certificate of sponsorship has been assigned to um, the migrant and they've submitted a tier two general application um, and the word submitted an application is that they've submitted the online form and they've made the government payments and you've got confirmation of that, then what the Home Office is saying is that you can, um, they can start working for ABC Limited, but if ABC Limited, um, if the, the migrant's visa is refused for whatever reason, then ABC Limited must stop um, sponsoring that migrant. So again, it's really important, especially during COVID-19, that the tier two migrant gets the right legal advice, because if it's that he or she has left their job to start working for a new company, but they haven't supplied the right information or documents and their applications refused, then they are going to be in a difficult situation because either they're going to have to appeal the decision if they are given an appeal right, and if not, they might be classed as an overstayer and have to return back to their country and come back in. So it is more specific that you, you know, that you would need to kind of carry out things correctly to make sure things are done. Um, properly. Also, when the migrant starts working for ABC Limited, what they should do is the company should um, 
normally they would need to see the original passport and biometric card to show that the migrant can work for ABC Limited. But obviously, because of COVID-19, face-to-face checks are not possible in, on, on, on many occasions. So what the Home Office have said is that you can do video chat. So like you and I are kind of, we can see each other. I would show you my passport and my biometric card. And then you would basically take a screenshot of that and sign on there that you've carried out a check on X date um, due to um, COVID-19. And then when things get back to normal um, and we see each other face to face or I come into the office, then I've got eight weeks to basically um, bring my documents to you and then you would carry out another right to work check. Um, and when you're carrying out another right to work check, what you would be doing, what you would be adding is that we've carried the right to work check out on X day due to COVID. However, now we've seen each other face to face and can confirm the tier two general document, the tier, sorry, the tier two biometric card is a genuine biometric card and put that um, on file as well. So you have two right to work checks for this particular migrant. And so if um, the Home Office attended um, or carried out uh, an audit, they'd want to see this documentation. And I guess, Mandy, um, with those checks, it, it's always worth making sure that you're on top of them and that they're on there because it, when you come to renew your licence and things like that, are, are you finding that more and more companies are being audited? Yeah, I mean, we are finding just generally from the beginning of the year, more and more companies are being audited. Um, I recently got a new instruction from uh, quite a large uh, school um, uh, they carried out, the Home Office had come to their premises and carried out that order audit out in January and at the beginning of June they basically said we had wrote to them and said that we are intending to revoke your sponsorship licence and they had like 20 working days to put together submissions of why the, the licence shouldn't be revoked. So, you know, more, we've seen, we're seeing more of this and I think you know, to kind of rectify this issue is going to probably cost the client in legal fees about fifteen to twenty-five thousand pounds. Whereas we do offer um, an audit, a compliance audit, in which we would go in, or you know, you would send us documentation for particular files that we've asked for, and we can actually see whether you are compliant, you know, according to what the Home Office requirements and guidance is. And I think now it's even more complicated because you're going to have guidance before COVID-19, guidance during COVID-19 and then guidance after COVID-19 um, and so it's going to be more complicated than it already is and you know as you know Padma uh, the Home Office documents aren't all in one place even now so you can imagine with extra COVID-19 stuff it's just going to be a bit of a minefield so what we're trying to do is put together um, a kind of pack so that you've got all what, what, what sorry all compliance regarding issues um, before, during, and after COVID-19. So you can use that, or the companies can use it as a tick box exercise that they actually have got everything in place. Um, so if they are audited, they know that you know they're not going to have an intention to revoke. Yeah, no, and I think um, speaking as an as an employment lawyer hat on. And um, again, I think this is where it really comes down to making sure that the offer letters, the communications that are sent to um, staff, etc., makes it very clear that that second check will be done, um, that it gives the right that if for whatever reason they don't bring in the documents, because the other thing that uh, a lot of frustration that my clients face is, someone turns up and says, oh, I've left my passport at home. And then you, you're stuck in that cycle of, oh, I'll bring it in tomorrow, I'll bring it in next week, I'll bring it in the week after. Um, and then it, it becoming an issue of not getting those documents or uh, especially sort of at a senior level of someone sort of saying, I need to get stuck in with my job. You've already seen it. I don't understand what the, the issues are here because you've got all the documents you need. Um, and, and that's both from, you know, people that are, are migrant workers, but also you've got the obligation um, to undertake checks, haven't you, against every employee? Um, so yeah. that includes uh, British nationals as well. Um, and that's where sometimes I certainly see a bit of resistance to say, well, you know, I'm a British national, you don't need my paperwork. But actually, you know, as an employee, you should have that. Um, and 
to not ask everyone uh, uh, yeah. the right to work documents from an employment perspective uh, does run the risk of um, uh, a, a discrimination claim really. So something just to be uh, wary of and, and careful of in that sense. Yeah. Um, so moving on to the next slide, um, which my uh, computer isn't behaving for the moment, but hopefully it will <laughs> move in a second. Um, moving on to a second case study, um, changes to the, the migrants work then because of coronavirus. So as, as an employment lawyer, one thing that I've been advising quite a lot on is uh, restructures um, and people having to, to dip in to pick up extra work because there's people shielding um, and so people that are able to attend work might be asked to pick up extra duties or even because of change of the, the business nature. So in those types of situations, um, Mandy, um, if you've got a sponsor license and um, you've, you've taken someone on with a specific role um, and that's what you've represented to the Home Office, that that's what they'll do. But because of COVID-19 and um, we've, we've furloughed staff and, and changed what they're actually doing, um, what, what must a company do in relation to someone that's furloughed? Do, do yeah. we have to tell the Home Office? Um, so, yes. What we recommend is that you inform on the sponsor management system um, that once, once you've furloughed your staff and your migrant, that you inform the, the Home Office on the SMS system. And also once you have reinstated them to their full time um, role or you know, they're receiving their full salary, that basically they then um, we inform them on the, we basically um, inform the Home Office on the SMS system again. So basically, in relation to the COVID uh, requirement, we would always recommend to put it onto the SMS system. Um, I don't think it's actually a requirement per se, but our advice is to do it. The reason being is it just makes it very clear and transparent with the Home Office exactly what it is you're doing at each stage. OK, great, thank you. Um, that's helpful. In terms of questions, we've had a couple come in, but please do keep having them come in um, and we'll we'll try and answer them as we go along. Um, just moving on to the next slide then. Um, what about um, someone who's a tier four general migrant worker? Um, yeah. And they, so tier four general, as I understand it, Mandy, is a student um, who is sponsored to, to be in the UK for, for study purposes, um, yeah. but they are allowed to work part time, typically 20 hours a week um, during that term time. Um, mm -hmm. What if, and we've seen obviously universities suspending lectures, those types of things, um, and so migrant workers who are students um, tend to have a bit more availability. So um, can, can we ask them to work full time? Um, yeah, so if they can show the employer that the university is closed and um, due to the pandemic, then the student can work full time. So it's basically like they're in like in holiday time. The norms of it. When a student, when a tip or student um, is out of term time, they can work full time. So it's the same kind of scenario with 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 COVID nineteen. But what we again recommend is that the uh, that the company get a sponsor, so it gets a letter from the university confirming the date that they have started, uh, the, they've closed their, their, their college or university down and the date that they think that they are going to reopen because then you're clear as an employer that your tier four general migrant can work full time during that period definitely. Um, it may be that with some universities and colleges that they think yes they're going to open up on the 30th of May but actually it transpires that they're not going to open up until the, the 30th of June so you're just kind of getting updated letters from the university so again if you are audited by the Home Office at some point it's clear that the reason why you that you allowed this tier 4 migrant during term time that you, that you basically allow them to work um, full time also, what's um, important to know is some students who are employed by the NHS Trust within certain professions, which I'll come on to in a moment, 
they're not restricted at the moment to working just 20 hours um, per week during term time. They can actually work more than 20 hours if they are a biochemist, biological scientist, dental practitioner, a health professional, a medical practitioner, medical radiographer, a midwife, nurse, occupational therapist, um, paramedic, pharmacist, physiotherapist, podiatrist, psychologist, social worker, speech and language therapist um, and therapy professionals. So they can actually at this precise moment in time work more than the normal 20 hours, even during term time. I'm a little bit nervous about this in that um, I would recommend that the, uh, that, the, that the migrant looks on a regular basis on the Home Office website or contacts an immigration lawyer just to check when this restriction is going to go back to 20 hours um, per week. But at the moment, um, as of yesterday, they could work more than 20 hours during term time. And, and, and Mandy, one, one of the questions that's come in is, um, is there a, an exception that if someone has just graduated as a tier four um, student um, in terms of then, do, do they have to be sponsored if that company wants to keep them on? So individuals graduated, they've been yeah. doing 20 hours a week or, or whatever it is, or, or working during um, holidays for this company and they really liked them. Um, is there a way of, do they have to go through a sponsorship route for that person as well or or is there something else that they can yeah, do? So, so with the tier four, so if you're on a tier four student, in order for them to be sponsored by a company, they would need to be sponsored under the, one of the tier two categories. Um, so they would need to carry out, you know, um, they need to apply for a tier two general visa and go through that whole process of having a, a certificate of sponsorship assigned to them. It may be that they might be able to work sooner rather than later because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but ultimately they would need to have the same as before um, the pandemic. You need to have a certificate of sponsorship assigned to that particular um, applicant or that migrant. And, and do, you, do you have to still do the full resident labour market test and, and, um, and, apply and look externally before we give it to that candidate that's already been working for us as a student? So I'd, I'd need to just double check that actually because with students, I don't think they need to carry out the resident labour market test in the UK. Um, yeah. But I would need to just double check that because I haven't done a tier four one for a very long time. Yeah, so, I think, um, yeah, the, the, there are some exceptions, aren't there, that yeah. um, as a student that's already within the business and, and working in there, there are some relaxations of, of the resident labour market yeah. test that needs to be uh, done. And like you say, obviously there needs to be um, a sponsor still needs to be sponsored etc but it, it tends to be an easier process if you've yeah. already had them as a tier four student um, with you uh, in that sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So looking at um, that a bit further then, um, one of the employees that we've got has applied to extend their leave to remain so ju just to explain that um, Mandy there's another category of visa that you can have someone uh, that you can employ them under and that is where you're not sponsoring them but they may have of their own volition for various reasons uh, applied for a right to remain in the UK is that correct is that what that type of visa is yeah yeah exactly that so it's basically um you can extend there's so many different immigration routes that people can come into the UK um on so you know, the route that we've been speaking about mostly is a tier two general, but people can come into the UK on a, a spouse visa, um, on a partner visa, um, or um, a, a sole representative visa even. And when you have uh, somebody on, let's say, a spouse visa, they don't have restrictions. They can work for any company that they wish to work you know, that wants to employ them and they wish to to work um, that they wish to work for. Mm. So when in, in those circumstances, um, let's say in, in this situation where you have the person um, they have applied for, they've applied for their spouse visa extension, they've been, they're waiting for a decision to come through. As long as they made their application before their current visa expired, um, 
they would be entitled to work for their same employer, um, uh, they'd be able to work for the employer until a decision is made on that application. What is important to know and what we always say to our clients, I've mentioned it um, in, in this webinar already, is that basically they should always um, take a copy of the application form and also make sure they have confirmation that payment has been taken on or before their the current visa expires. Um, and then about a week later, what the employer can do is actually carry out what's called an employer checking service through the Home Office um, website. And what you can do is, if the employer checking service comes back um, as a positive verification notice, that gives the employer the security that they can employ this person um, normally it's for six months without any without any issues. Having said that, we always say to our employer clients that they should on a monthly basis contact the employee, the migrant in question and ask them have they received a decision on their application because the positive verification notice, even, even though it gives you a six month uh, window to kind of say, yeah, it's fine for your, this employee to work for you, this migrant to work for you. If you knowingly know that that migrant's visa has actually been refused during that six month period and you still employ them, then that's a major breach of the immigration rules and regulations for the employer. So if by sending an email to the um, migrant and saying that look we want you to let us know once a decision has been made on your application or as soon as a decision has been made on your application you must let us know and um, if you send that on a, a on a monthly basis and you've got a record of that then that should prevent the um issue that you knowingly knew that this person had actually you know potentially had the application had been refused yeah so it's just kept them back yeah, I think we're seeing a lot of this, aren't we, Mandeep, at the moment? Um, and, and we dealt with um, a couple of these yesterday as well. Yeah. And um, I think as a talking with my employment hat on, um, it, you need to do everything that Mandeep has just said. Um, but then when it comes to termination, what I have seen questions in relation to is um, regardless of service employers then panicking and then suddenly going ah right we can't employ them quickly get rid and that, that's what we've got to do which yeah. which is correct that you need to to do that but um unfortunately you as an employer you're stuck in a situation where you need to balance out two sets of risks you've got the home office risk and, and everything that mandeep has just said but also from an employment perspective, and um, you've got a contract of employment with this individual still. So if they've got more than two years service, you need to balance it out against a risk of uh, unfair dismissal claims, um, discrimination claims, or, or even breach of contract of should you be giving notice and, and the amounts of notice. And, and that really is very, very fact specific of working out which is the lesser of two evils or um, where you would uh, seek to protect yourself or what you can do to minimise those risks. One point that I probably would make though is um, we've seen situations before and you know cases come through the tribunals where individual has been dismissed because on the face of it they don't have the right to work in the UK, haven't produced the relevant documents etc. Um, have been dismissed but actually and, and dismissed for illegality um, saying it's illegal for us to, to have you working with us but actually um, it later on transpires that um, they had another right to be in the UK such as ancestry or something like that it's just that the the application wasn't made at the time um, and so from an employment perspective to dismiss someone for illegality purposes then falls foul on its face so I would always recommend that you're dismissing not only for illegality, but use an alternative reason of what is known as some other substantial reason to say, well, actually, even if it wasn't illegal um, for us to continue employing you, there is another reason as to why your uh, dismissal was fair. And it's because we asked for documentation. You didn't provide that to us. So it was reasonable for us in those circumstances to terminate. And that will help you. Um, in terms of defending that unfair dismissal or discrimination claim that comes forward. So just something to be um, 
mindful when when in those situations i think yeah. um, and and also i think so oh. and also um sometimes with the home office you might get a negative verification notice or when the when an employer is carried out an employer checking service check sometimes they have come back neg negative when actually that's incorrect so again yeah. we've had a case where um the person was going to be dismissed by the employer but actually when we looked in the face of it that person was allowed to, to remain and work in the uk and we had to kind of overturn the employer checking service and ask them to look into it in a bit the home office to look into it in a bit more detail to then basically get them to change their decision which you know which they can do so even before if you get a positive and really a negative employer checking service result it's always worthwhile speaking with um an employer uh, an employment and immigration lawyer just to make sure that you're not doing anything you know incorrectly by dismissing the, the applicant or the migrant sorry yeah and, and and mandy again as an employment lawyer what one of the things that i'm unfortunately working a lot on at the moment is um is restructures and and redundancies and um i think one panic that a lot of my clients have had is someone sponsored or someone is on a foreign visa um, and and they rely on work to um to be in the uk and um, from your perspective, is there anything in the Home Office guidance or anything that you've seen at the moment that says just because someone is sponsored or because they are a foreign migrant worker that they can't be part of a redundancy process that you're going through as a whole for a business? No, no, they can still be part of a redundancy process because obviously, you know, if the business has to make people redundant, they do it through a certain process. And if, you know, a migrant is in that process, then yeah, then, you know, they can. Um, they can't they're not invincible from being made redundant because you know company situations change um the what you what that company would need to do if they do make the migrant redundant is obviously give them that letter and then the home office should um send a letter to the migrant to say that they've got 60 days from the date of the letter that they give to either leave the uk or find another employer um, yeah. so they can be sponsored or switch into a different category so for example if they are sponsored um now um but then they're also married to a british citizen they may at that stage you know during the 60 day period switch their visa from a tier two general visa to a spouse visa so that they can then you know either still well stay in the uk to be with their their partner but also um, work for a different employer um, should the need arise uh, or should they want to. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's always it's always worth looking at what because with a lot of people that we deal with, they have more than one route to stay in the UK, and sometimes they're not aware of the route. So a lot of people, um, which still surprises me to be honest, that are not quite sure or, or aware of the the, the ancestry route or you know they may be able to get european citizenship somehow um, and yeah. so it's kind of working out what they you know what options they have and then working with them to 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 try and sort out you know their situation yeah and i think as you say that goes back to my illegality point of just yeah. being careful of, of what the reason is um for for, for dismissal there and um, so we've, we've had a couple of questions uh more questions come in and um, so in terms of one of the questions relates to um, quarantining and COVID tests, um, etc. And if people are on negative, one thing that I would say about that is it's a moving beast. And um, so something to um, constantly check the guidance, because as we've seen from Boris's announcement yesterday, there's um, plans to, to start opening things up further. There have been discussions about um, when someone travels from a foreign country, should they quarantine for 14 days? But equally, um, there are some countries with which um, there may be some air bridges which would negate the need for a 14 day quarantine. Um, so I, <coughs> excuse me, and I think that will really depend on the jurisdiction which that person is coming from and what sense checks you are doing in terms of is it really necessary that that person has to be back in a workplace to do their work um, because the safest approach would be that if they're in a country without one of these air bridges that the government is planning to announce um, 
then think about what task can we give them for 14 days to work from home um, or, or not be in the, in the workplace. If it is that they have to be in the workplace, then it might be a case of putting down some sense barriers of what you're doing from a health and safety perspective of we've done checks, they've come back negative, we've repeated those checks as well. Um, because the other thing that we just need to be slightly careful of from, from looking at the news at the moment is we're getting some false positives and, and those types of things. So I think it is really fact specific and also a moving beast in that we're, we're seeing different announcements being made. Um, so I, I think that is something where um, when you've asked the question is something that you just need to look at the, the different jurisdictions and maybe take advice as at that particular moment, um, also, depending if, on where we're at. Yeah, sorry. And also, if it's a, a migrant that's coming into the UK that's being sponsored, if they were, for example, going to be coming into the UK on the on the 1st of June, that they've had to be quarantined for 14 days or what have you, then really on the sponsor management system, you should say that the start date has actually changed so from the 1st to the 15th of, 15th of June. Again, just keep everything updated on the sponsor management system so that, um, again, if the Home Office asks for any information, you can give them specifics on what's been going on with each migrant that's been affected during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Yeah. Um, on your screens, um, just whilst we, we finish off with the last few questions, um, on your screens, you should hopefully get a link as well um, to fill in a feedback. Um, one thing that I should say about these sessions is that as Oma Mitchell, we're putting on um, sessions on a weekly basis. And this session arose out of feedback from one of our sessions um, asking for, for us to cover this type of information. So, so that information is really valuable to us to make sure that we are keeping um, our topics what we're discussing and what we're covering really relevant to what you want to hear and um, so if i could really make a plea for you to complete those um feedback forms and as i say there's a link on there and also if you want to put on there anything that you'd like us to discuss in a bit more depth with you then mandeep or i can give you a call so so just make sure you um you list that on there and um, another question that's come in is just in relation to um needing a relevant um, SOC code um, and I, I guess Mandy what one thing is that to sponsor someone and when you're making your your visa application there is a list isn't there um, on the yeah. government guidance um, that lists every possible occupation or, or group of um, remits so business development whatever that may be and uh, yeah all, all, all those different types of areas there's a list isn't there and that's known as a, a SOC code and yeah. when making an application people have to um, list that number don't they there's a, a unique yeah. code so you might say as I say a business developer I fit under code 3642 or whatever yeah um, and um, to make a valid application they you need to have a valid SOC code that's live at the time of making the application basically yeah. so basically um, yeah, so basically what happens is when um, so on the government website or Home Office website, you have different SOC codes. So there's SOC codes for shortage occupations, there's SOC codes for general positions. Um, and when a company is going to assign a certificate of sponsorship to a migrant, they've got to show which SOC code this person fits into. Now, more often than not, the SOC codes kind of some some SOC codes interlink with one another, and a lot of people worry, you know, which SOC code should I put this migrant in because they're doing both jobs really. And ultimately, with any job, you're not just doing you know specific things. You're doing a lot of you know with law, we're doing admin, we're doing meeting clients and things like that, as well as casework. Um, so what we recommend is when you're looking at the SOC codes. From the bullet points that are listed on the, the Home Office website, how may, which ones mo are best fitted to the migrant that you are wanting to sponsor? So normally I think there's about six or seven bullet points. And if you can say that actually, you know, out of, out of seven, um, your uh, prospective migrant meets four of those bullet points, that's enough for them to kind of fit into that particular SOC code. Yeah, I think um, you're right, aren't you, Mandy? I think people get quite nervous about that. But as long as yeah. you can show that you've done something reasonable, you've not just picked out a code that looks the best and fits the, the salary 
minimums that you need to meet um, yeah. Yeah. and not just tailoring stuff to do that as long as you've given some thought process to it um, it, it, it is possible isn't it that it can fit across two or three codes and you you just need to pick whatever's um, relevant uh, and, and most appropriate in those circumstances yeah no exactly. um, so conscious of time um i think we're, we're sort of heading towards the end of our session and um, so just one final um show of our coronavirus hub and um, if you Google it, you can then go onto a page um, such as the one that's appearing on, on the screens right now. As I say, there's lots of information on there um, of upcoming webinars and some free information, some policies, um, and we do keep it updated as the uh, the government updates um, the, the announcements that they're making as well and um, things that we're seeing come through. So um, if you're on the session today and you think uh, that might be worthwhile in terms of gathering some information, then please do take a look. And um, finally, another plea just to fill out your feedback forms. And um, so as I say, that we can keep these sessions relevant for you. And then finally, a thank you uh, from me and Mandeep um, for joining us on such a lovely sunny day. Um, and we'll let you get back into your gardens, hopefully, um, and hope to see you again soon. All right, thank you very much.